Hello everyone, I'm Luke Kennedy and I'm here to share the learning with our middle primary kids. Here's what we have coming up. In English, we'll discuss ways to make our writing flow. In maths, we'll unlock the mysteries of an ancient Chinese puzzle called a tangram. And in science, we'll be shown an interesting method for communicating observations. So it's time to fire up those minds for learning. Are you familiar with this scenario? You've been asked to answer a question in class, and when the teacher sees or hears your answer, they could say, could you expand on that, please? Or they might also say, use more cohesive devices, please. Well, today, Pascal has come up with some tips that might help. Hello. Today, I'm going to give you a few tips on how to expand your writing and how to use cohesive devices to make your writing flow and build meaning. First of all, let's look at what it means to expand writing. It means adding more information or details. Sometimes it's all too easy to write a fast and furious answer and then it's done. But there are ways you can provide additional information or detail to help the reader understand more about what you're telling them. If you are writing an imaginative text, such as a narrative story, adding more detail can help describe the setting, the events or the characters more vividly for the reader. In informative texts, additional information can show your thinking and understanding. And in persuasive texts, you can expand your writing with more reasons to convince or more details about your opinions. So in a nutshell, it makes you sound more knowledgeable about your topic. One way to expand your writing is to look at the noun or topic you are writing about and provide more detail about that. Tell the reader more about what you know about it. You can do this by thinking of the questions, who, what, when, where, how, and why. Here's an example. Let's imagine we're writing about foxes using research website SurfariNet, where there's a great page on underground animals. We want to say foxes are clever animals with a bushy tail. But this could be expanded to show more of our knowledge. Using our who, what, when, where, how and why questions, we could ask, how are they clever? And why does being clever matter to foxes? I'm going to make a table and some notes about each question from my research. What can I find out about foxes being clever? I can see that foxes double back on their tracks and that means they can confuse their predators. The tail is very useful. It helps the fox to change direction and that means they get away if being chased. And it also wraps around the curled up fox when it sleeps, so that keeps it warm. Do you think if we include this in our writing, it will provide more useful information and details for our reader? Foxes are clever because they can use their bushy tails to double back on their tracks, which confuses their predators. If they are being chased, their tail helps them to change direction quickly so they can get away. When foxes curl up to sleep, their tail wraps around their body so they keep warm. This is definitely what you call an expanded answer and your teacher would be very happy with it, I think. And it didn't take forever either, did it? I have another tip for expanding your writing that I'll share later on in this episode. But first, let's talk about cohesive devices. What are they? Cohesive devices are language features, words, used in texts to bind different parts of a text together, to give it unity and make it flow. Think of tape connecting ideas in texts together. Two types of cohesive devices include pronoun references and text connectives. You already know about pronouns. You know they are words that take the place of a noun. Pronouns mostly refer to a noun previously mentioned in the text. They help the text to flow and make it easier to read. Can you remember some pronouns? Let's look at some personal pronouns. Words like I, we, me, she, him, they, it, them, him, 
or her. And there are possessive pronouns like mine, hers, his, ours, yours and theirs. Have a look at this sentence. Foxes are clever because the foxes can use the fox's bushy tails to double back on the fox's tracks, which confuses the fox's predators. You can already see this doesn't flow, can't you? Let's make use of some personal and possessive pronouns to make it more cohesive. Foxes are clever because they can use their bushy tails to double back on their tracks, which confuses their predators. In this sentence, they and their are pronouns and they refer to the noun foxes. I can also remove the final there because we understand that the predators are the foxes predators. That's much better. This is my final tip for today. Another cohesive device is to use text connectives in our writing. And as I mentioned, this is another way to expand our writing. Text connectives link ideas in the section of text. They can sequence events through words related to time or be used to show cause and effect. Text connectives related to time or sequence include after, then, meanwhile, later, next, before and finally. For example, after she noticed the animal's bushy tail, she knew it had to be a fox. Text connectives referring to cause and effect include because, so, but, and therefore. Because shows a reason or cause, as in foxes are clever because they can use their bushy tails to double back on their tracks. So shows an effect or result. When foxes curl up to sleep, their tail wraps around their body so they keep warm. And but shows cause and effect through difference. Moles spend their entire lives underground, but other animals like the fox and the rabbit spend some time below and above ground. When you write, you can consider including one of these text connectives to make your writing flow and to expand your writing. I hope you can use these tips when you're writing. Next time you are asked to write for class, try to use some of these tips Consider who, what, when, where, how and why questions about your topic. Experiment with pronoun referencing and use text connectives to link your ideas. Well, that's all for today. See you next time. The My Place competition is back for 2020. This year, the Australian Children's Television Foundation and the Australian Literacy Educators Association are calling on students in years three to 10 to create stories about your place in this historically significant time. The coronavirus pandemic has reshaped our lives and historians of the future will want to know how this looked and felt for you, your family and your community. The 2020 My Place competition asks you to reflect on this moment in time and share your thoughts, observations and experiences through creative writing. Entries can be uploaded until the 26th of June. I love a good puzzle. It gives my brain such a great workout and keeps me entertained for ages. And I never try to search for hacks to solve them either. Well, hardly ever. But I make sure that I don't give up too early and I give it a really good go. So I'm looking forward to this mathematics lesson because it features a puzzle that's new to me. And this one should go like that. <laughs> Check this out. Hi everyone, I'm Teresa. 
we're going to be exploring an ancient Chinese puzzle called a tangram. Tangrams use the mathematical properties of squares, triangles and other common shapes to make pictures such as these. We'll get back to tangrams later. First, we need to understand some features of shapes. Here are some common two-dimensional shapes. We can take two of these triangles and join them together to make a square. Notice how each triangle has three sides and three angles. But when we put the two triangles together to make a square, we now have four sides and four angles. There we are, like that. Let's look at another example. Let's use two different triangles. So we've still got three corners and three sides, all right, but the angles are different and the length of the sides is different. If you join them together, you can make a slanted square or a rhombus. It even looks a little bit like a diamond. We could also take two squares and join them together to make a rectangle. So put those two beside each other and they've turned from two squares into a rectangle. Let's look more closely at our rhombus again. We used two triangles to create this rhombus. If a dotted line is put from one corner to the other, we can see the two triangles that have been used to create this shape. What if we put the dotted line from the other corner? Now we can see two different triangles could have been used to create the same shape. OK, let's get to the puzzle. This tangram was made by starting with a simple 4x4 grid and five lines. All right, so draw your lines like this. First of all, we've got one line all the way from one corner to the other. All right, then we've got another line, not quite at the corners this time. All right, then we do number three. Go down like this, all the way down to there. And then we've got number four, it's just a little fella down here. And then lastly, number five, just sneaks in there. All right, that's, we've got our seven pieces. When we cut along the lines, we have seven pieces. Each piece is named a tan. There is an infinite number of combinations, but there are rules to constructing a tangram. All seven pieces must be used and no piece can overlap. We're going to use all of the tangram pieces to form it back into a square. All right, now I've got to follow the rules, so I've got to make sure I use all the pieces. So put them down, bring them in. Yeah. And hit this one down here to make a corner. Square's going to fit nicely in here, and this triangle's going to fit in here. All right, now what I'm going to do with this triangle is I'm going to flip it, all right, to make it fit into the triangle, into its spot nicely. So I'll flip it, all right, so I flipped it into place. That was how I made it complete the square. I did a flip. There we are. All right, that was really fast. Usually it takes ages to work it out. Okay, next we're going to make a large triangle. So we're going to rearrange things a bit again. So I'm going to put that there. And I'll move my shapes a different way this time. So I've got this little bit down here. I've got this one here. All right, now. We've got this here. All right, now this triangle, all right, I'm going to turn to make it fit, to make the corner of the triangle. So you can see there I've, oops, I've turned to make it fit. So it was over here and to make it fit to make the large triangle, I did a turn. There, done. Can you see the smaller square inside the triangle? that's made from five other shapes? Do you remember how to use two triangles to make a square and how to use two squares to make a rectangle? 
Now we can convert this big triangle into a rectangle. We can take two large triangle pieces and join them to make a square. So we get these two, join them up to make a square. All right, we'll just move this over a little bit. Then we're going to slide the square alongside the other square to make a rectangle. So I'm doing a slide, slide it into place. So to pop it into place, I did a slide and there's our large rectangle. Now it's time to make a picture with our tangrams. Can you see the swimming turtle? Let's try making it with our seven tangram pieces. Hmm, let's see. The small square is used for the head. The two small triangles are the back flippers. The side flippers are these two pieces. Now, all we have to make is the square body using two large triangles. Do you remember how to make a square from two triangles? We join the two triangles to make the square and we're finished. We've made a turtle picture from seven tangram pieces. Let's make another picture with our tangrams. How about a helicopter? Let's try making it with our seven tangram pieces. Hmm, let's see. The small square is used for the tail rotor. This piece is at the back of the helicopter. The triangle is one of the propellers and the two large triangles make the square body. Now all we have left is to make the last propeller from our two smaller triangles. Can you see how we will do it? We will join the two triangles like this and when we put the last propeller on, we're finished. We've made a helicopter from seven tangram pieces. Okay, let's recap what we've learned today. We now know that shapes have properties, including the number and length of sides and the number and size of angles. We can use the properties of shapes to create other shapes or solve tangrams. Here's the turtle we made earlier. Remember, there were seven pieces. You might like to print or cut out your own tangram pieces and make some other pictures. There's plenty of pictures you can make with tangrams. Perhaps you could make a challenge for each day of the week. See you next time. I am definitely going to take that challenge and see how many pictures that I can create. Let's take a break from learning now to hear the story of two very interesting students who live in the outback city of Mount Isa, which is in the Gulf Country region of Queensland's far northwest. That means hello in our language. My name is Selena. And I'm Alicia. And we are two Kalkadu women from Mount Isa. And welcome to our country. I'm in year 12 and I'm the Indigenous captain for Spinifex State College, as well as the 2020 Youth Parliament member for Traeger. I'm in year 10 and I'm the Leichhardt Health representative for my year level. Despite attending school in a rural and remote area, we thrive here and receive great opportunities and a fantastic education. However, during these unprecedented times, it can be hard. But with the hard work and support of our teachers and family, we have been able to cope with the transition into online learning. On the weekends, our family love to go out bush and look for artefacts, ochre and occasionally seasonal bush tucker. It is important for us to always go out on country as it is an important part of our identity as Aboriginal people. We love dancing. It makes us feel so proud to be Aboriginal and allows us to showcase our Kalkadoon culture. Dancing is second nature to my family and it is something that we will continue to share and practice for the rest of our lives. From our spirit to yours, Nini Nani Kulukulu, Kalkadoomumata. Farewell from Kalkadoon country. Most of us do a lot of communicating in a day. We talk to people in person or on the phone or virtually, and we can also write emails or stay in touch by letter or by text. 
Each of these methods has a different purpose, so we select the best approach for each situation. Today, Brett will look at ways that scientists can use to communicate their observations. When scientists carry out investigations, they not only make observations, they have to explain them. This allows them to effectively communicate their research findings around the world. When we explain things, we are making an idea or situation clear by describing it in more detail or revealing more facts. One way we can do this is by comparing and contrasting two things. When we compare things, we're looking for similarities between them. What about them is the same? When we contrast things, we are looking for the differences between them. Now, comparing and contrasting provides a lot of information for us to work with. To help us organise this information, we can use a Venn diagram. This diagram is very useful as it helps us to visualise our thinking. This Venn diagram has two overlapping circles. Each circle is used to represent something we are making observations about. The overlapping part shows the traits or features that are the same between both things. The remaining parts of each circle show the features that are unique to each one of them. Let's use bananas and lemons as an example. We'll start by identifying the features of each thing. Bananas are a fruit. They're smooth, yellow, sweet, hmm. and they have a curved or cylindrical shape. What about lemons? What are their features? Well, they're also a fruit. They're also yellow. The surface of a lemon isn't smooth, it's rough or bumpy. The lemon is ugh, sour. Oh, and it is also round or football shaped. So, we know that both bananas and lemons were grown from trees, and whilst the trees are living, the fruit has been picked and doesn't show the characteristics of life. So, the fruits are now non-living. Now, let's fill out our Venn diagram. We'll place all the unique features of bananas in one circle and the features of lemons in the other. All the features that are the same for both will be placed in the overlapping section of our diagram. Now, what are the features of bananas and lemons that were the same? They're similar in that they are both fruits that grow on trees and they are now non-living things. And they're both yellow. So these can go in the overlapping sections of the diagram. How are bananas different to lemons? Remember, bananas are smooth, sweet, and have a curved cylindrical shape. So let's place these in one of the circles. Lemons are different because they are rough, sour, and round or football shaped. Our Venn diagram is now complete. We can see how this diagram has helped us to organise the information visually so that we can clearly see the similarities and differences between our two things. All right. Let's look at an explanation of the life cycle of living things. We can add details by comparing and contrasting the life cycles of an animal and a plant and use the Venn diagram to help. Let's explore the life cycle of an Australian native animal and plant, a sea turtle and a banksia tree. Remember, a life cycle is all the stages an organism goes through in its life and includes offspring. Make sure you keep an eye out for any similarities and differences. Marine or sea turtles live approximately 80 years and while they spend most of their time at sea, the females come ashore during the breeding season to lay about 100 eggs on a sandy beach. One and a half to two months later, a baby turtle or hatchling breaks out of the egg. The young or juvenile turtles head out to sea where they mature into adults. This takes about 20 years, and after that, the females can then lay eggs, so the cycle can continue. So, the life cycle of the sea turtle has four stages. Now, let's look at the life cycle of the banksia tree. Banksia trees can live for over 100 years, and they depend on fire to survive. A banksia seed germinates in the soil, that is, it grows roots and a shoot and becomes a seedling. The seedling grows into an immature tree, and this takes about six years. The mature tree can then develop flowers. From the flowers, woody seed pods develop, 
and the seeds can be dispersed across the land by the hot wind of a fire so that new plants can grow and the cycle can continue. So, the Banksia tree has six stages of its life cycle. Okay, now we've explored the life cycle of these living things, how are they similar? Both the Banksia tree and the sea turtle grow bigger and mature, so we can place these in the overlapping parts of the Venn diagram. How are they different? The sea turtle goes through four stages of its life cycle that includes egg, hatchling, juvenile and adult stage, whereas the Banksia tree goes through a six-stage life cycle that includes seed, seedling, immature tree, mature tree, flower and seed pod. Let's add these features to the Venn diagram. Take a look at the completed Venn diagram. It shows that the life cycles can be similar, but they are not all the same. By making careful observations and comparing and contrasting two different cycles, we now have more details to use in our explanations of the life cycles of living things. Let's recap what we've learned today. We know that scientists compare and contrast things to explain or add detail to their observations. A Venn diagram is useful in that it is a tool to visually organise that information. And plants and animals have life cycles that share some similarities but have some differences. Now it's your turn. You might like to make careful observations to compare and contrast things around your home or backyard, like different types of leaves or shells, anything at all. Use a Venn diagram to organise your observations. Thanks for watching and see you next time. Well, I have to say thank you everyone for engaging your brain so firmly into gear for those lessons. Middle primary students, you can take a brain break now because Victoria will be joining the upper primary kids for their lessons next. This movement exercise is one that you will really enjoy if you love to dance. Bye for now. Hi, I'm Jane. Hi, I'm Olivia and I'm in grade four. Olivia, what is your favourite hobby? Ballet. Ballet. Do you think we could do some ballet movements right here, right now? OK. What would she start with? What would be our first move? Well, let's start with plies. So you have to put your feet in a V shape. Feet in a V. When you have to put your hands and kind of like hide a message from someone. And then you plie. And you, your legs have to be a diamond shape. So out to a diamond and, and back in. together. Out to a diamond and back together. What would be our second move, Olivia? Step hop. Right, oh, let's step. show us that one. How you do it is you step hop and point. Step hop and point. Step, step hop and point. point. And step, step hop and point. point. Beautiful. Third, third one we'll do is that hold balance. So you do this and then you get to choose what foot. And then you just stare at something for like how long you want it to stay. So if you focus your eyes, you can stay as long as any time. Mm -hmm. And you can change foot. I'll change foot and stay focusing on one spot so you don't get the wobbles. There are our three ballet moves today. Olivia, so thank you so much for sharing those ballet moves that we could do in a small space. Thank you. Now let's do a curtsy to show up to our thank you. Thank you.